With our special guest tonight, David Sarita. You know, we uh, talked about water last week in the cave, six inches of it. Tonight we're going to talk about water, the great mystery with David, and also consciousness. Our guest, David Sarita, next on Coast to Coast AM. Nobel Prize winners and more amazing scientists, biologists, and chemists are discovering the incredible properties of water. Water, it appears, has memory and consciousness, and as it turns out, our bodies and entire universe is made mostly of the stuff, H2O. Find out how this new science is helping to explain the consciousness of the universe. We're going to turn now to our friend David Sarita. David's first aspiration in life was to become an astronaut, and after seeing a UFO with a friend, David grew up as a UFO enthusiast. His interest in space, religion, philosophy, astronomy, and science led him on his career in related fields. David has studied world religion, and here he is. Hey, David, how are you? Hey, George, good to hear your voice. What's new with you? Well, enormous things. I mean, in fact, this little element, hydrogen and oxygen, water, has got me more excited in the past year than just about anything. Because there are breakthroughs and new research being done into water that could solve the energy crisis, could reclaim polluted waterways and help heal amazing diseases just by this profound discovery that's being done by and researchers all over the world. I mean, it's really incredible. But also, water may have the ability to communicate virtually over any distance in the universe instantaneously and thereby ultimately giving us the possibility of communicating with other star systems through super sensors that are sensitive to certain vibrations in water. I mean, it's it's really the most incredible miracle, and I've been enlightened in the past uh, couple of years into the subject of water, but also um, where this research is going and, and how it can really solve almost all of our problems. And we look at the world today, and you see it more than I do, because, I mean, what you're doing with your show, you're, you're interviewing the most interesting people, I think, on the planet almost every night. What a fun job I've got. Yeah, yeah. I, I, sometimes I wonder, what's it like to be in George Norrie's mind? Because you hear, you know, and you listen to <laughs> the people so intensely every night of the week, except for your, you know, your vacations and your breaks. And I just can't imagine what it's like to be in, inside of your mind. But it's, you know, when you, when you first say water to people, they think, oh, you know, it's just, you know, the stuff I drink every day and I bathe in it. I mean, what could be so special? Exactly. But when you consider that, let's go, let's first start with the Big Bang, you know, the birth of the universe. Over 100 to 1,000 seconds after the Big Bang, hydrogen is born, the H and H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. And that hydrogen establishes itself virtually everywhere in the universe. It's number one on the periodic table. And as we, as we see the birth of the universe and we see the, the, the beginnings of the spiraling arms of, the, for example, our own Milky Way galaxy, those spiraling gas arms are made of hydrogen. And then you think of smaller spirals start to form and stars are born. Light is born because of hydrogen fusion. Our sun is fusing hydrogen, manufacturing helium, and giving us light. And you think of the hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy all burning with hydrogen. And then you come to the idea that 13 and a half or so billion years later after the Big Bang, organic life, human beings are born, and we're 75 to 90 percent water, depending on how much you know, water you drink. And all living things, even mosquitoes, need water. So you think of, now what does it mean if scientists can prove that this little, this little element that is virtually existent everywhere in the universe, can communicate with different bodies of distant hydrogen instantaneously, and that it has consciousness, and that the consciousness of water is kind of like um, um, Professor Rustam Roy at Penn State calls an alphabet. You can give it new words and new sentences, and therefore it structures itself differently according to the information you give it. Does it reason, David? W say that again? Does it reason? Does it have that ability? Well, that's further to be known. But now that we've followed that model, let's look at consciousness. We look at even actually the second verse in the book of Genesis in the Bible. We see God moves God's 
spirit over the face of the waters, and then there's light. So we look at this model, and actually, before I go further, there's an amazing photo on your website. You know the one of the, the woman's glasses, and you see the teardrop, and you see the shape of what mm-hmm. looks like you know, the Virgin Mary or a holy figure? It's in the photo section on your website. Right. So we see that, you know, an, this example that Masaru Emoto really started, the idea of cryogenically flash-freezing water after it's been exposed to emotion, music, thoughts, and different intentions. And we see, for all the people who, who know Masaru Emoto, he's, he's pretty much a legend now, you see that this, this idea that cryogenically, instantaneously freezing water, we're freezing the structure of the information inside of water, and it gives us different architectures. And when we look at those architectures, in a way, they're kind of like a language. When you see flash frozen water crystals exposed to Beethoven, you see this beautiful symmetry. If you say the words, I hate you to the water, you see this chaos. If you say Hitler, you see this crazy mess. If you say thank you, you see again these amazing architectures. So the idea that what Masaru Emoto has started and I just had the opportunity to have um, lunch with him last week. And, He's a great guy. We had him on the show a couple of years ago, David. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. And and now it's like the research is exploding. I mean, people like Kurt Worthlich, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Martin Chaplin, he's a professor at London South Bank University. Martin Chaplin is one of the pivotal um, scientists and professors at a major university who's in the middle of this argument over whether water has memory and consciousness or not. And when you read his paper, which I you know, had the pleasure to read, you see that the evidence in support of water having memory and consciousness is so overwhelming. And, and the arguments against it are because we don't know why and how it has memory and consciousness. And because we can't explain how it works, he says we can't even explain how gravity and why gravity works, yet we know gravity exists. The observations are consistent across the board over hundreds of researchers into this phenomena. And what we're seeing is that you can put a new language of consciousness on water to do a myriad of different miraculous um, problem-solving technologies. For example, we can restructure water to actually help heal the human body. We'll get into this later. You can restructure water to reclaim polluted waterways, whole lakes, uh, utterly devastated by environmental pollution, have been reclaimed in three years by introducing restructured water, giving the water new information. And now we see the idea that the, the structure of hydrogen may be the missing link to nuclear fusion, the, David, the holy grail of, of infinite energy. Some time ago we had a guest on as well. His name was uh, Raymond Grace, mm-hmm. and he through uh, his abilities and everybody else's, concentrated on water and then took little pieces of the water and used it and put it into, you know, larger bodies of water. And it did much the same thing as Dr. Emoto has been working on. Right. That shows also the power of a very focused positive intention can actually transform a whole body of darkness or polluted water, which is something, you know... um, um, that has been done with, with holy water. There's been many tests with uh, testing religious or spiritually blessed water from multiple religions, and when you put that holy, you know, blessed water in a vial of ordinary tap water, it renders all of the tap water holy. So it shows that the overwhelming darkness doesn't envelop the, the positively restructured water, rather vice versa. It shows how powerful that is. So because I spent, you know, most of, uh, uh, the better part of 10 years of my life working on nuclear fusion and supporting the works of Dr. Bogdan Maglich and all of his um, co-supporters in Helium-3 fusion, and the goal to attain this environmentally benign form of energy has really, to me, it's kind of like it's disappeared. It, it has fallen off the face of the map. It, it's something that people don't even talk about anymore because because they couldn't attain fusion. If we did, we wouldn't be in this mess that we would have electric cars that do five and 700 horsepower. And, you know, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be fighting and, and, and struggling over the